Hey folks, Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple here today and I'm trying something a little bit different for a change. I can't always guarantee at busy periods that I'm going to be able to play a game enough times to give it a full review. This is usually the case around Gen Con time, sometimes the UK Games Expo, but more importantly, Essen. That time is always busy with a ton of games coming out and I just can't physically always get them played umpteen amount of times in order to give them a full review. The other problem is that the COVID crisis has made it very difficult for me to play a lot of games multiplayer wise in frequent succession. And so this means that a game could be hanging around on my shelf of shame or it could be something I can't get hold of. Either way, it just basically means that it could take a long time before I've played it enough times to go, right, here's the full review. So what I'm trying to do here is basically go over what I consider to be my first impressions of a game. If I can play a game enough times to give it a full review, it will get one in the usual format you've been seeing over the last few weeks. But if I can't get the game played enough times and I want to talk about it, then I'll do these first impression videos where essentially you'll watch the playthrough of the game as I'm talking over in voiceover mode. Not too many special effects and not too many clips, you know, because I need to keep the editing time on these quite low, but still giving you enough information to make a decision on whether the game is right for you. Of course, based on only, say, two or three plays max of a game, whereas normally I like to play a game considerably more times before I decide to give it a full review. Today I'm talking about Praga Kaput Regni, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Players will take on the role of wealthy citizens who are organising various building projects in medieval Prague. By expanding their wealth and joining in the construction, they gain favour with the king. Players choose some six actions on the game board which is represented by something called the Action Crane. They are always available but they're weighted with a constantly shifting array of costs and benefits as they spin round. By using these actions you can increase your resources, improve the strength of your chosen actions and build up the city, the bridge and the surrounding city walls. You don't have many actions in this game but you can gain additional actions with the use of a window currency or even participate in the construction of St. Vita's Cathedral because it's a medieval Euro game, of course there's a church somewhere. You're going to burn in a very special level of hell. Clever players will discover synergies between carefully timed actions and the rewards from constructing civic projects as all of the mechanisms mesh together. But you only have about 16 actions throughout the entire game even though it is possible to potentially gain additional ones. Once the game end is triggered, you total up all your victory points, and of course, the player with the most victory points wins. Of course! Now I'll do my best to stick to the detail format, but of course first impressions means I can only go into so much detail at times, and in this particular case I have not played a physical copy of Praga Kaput Regni, I've only played it on Tabletop Simulator. And before you guys get on my case, this is an official mod sanctioned by Delicious Games. Everybody got that? So we'll go with duration first, and I usually like to add 30 minutes to every game that I play multiplayer when it comes to Tabletop Simulator, just because it usually takes longer to play an online game than it does to play an offline one. I know some people disagree with me on this, but personally, I don't think you can simulate clicking and dragging pieces across a 3D rendered board quicker than you can simply just pick them up with your fingers and put them where you need them to go. With Praga, I've played it solo, with three players and with four players. It took me about an hour to play the solo mode, which wasn't too bad going actually. However, we'll get onto the solo mode in a bit more detail later. In terms of the free player, it took me two and a half hours in my first game, this was my first game, bear in mind, to play it, and that's not too bad for free players on Tabletop Simulator while learning it. I mean, the others knew what they were doing and I'd already watched a video in advance, but still, I had to be essentially taught the game, but it still only took about two and a half hours. The four player took a bit longer at three hours, but that, I think, was down to a little bit of analysis paralysis, which certainly can occur with this game. But overall, that's not too bad a length. I was kind of expecting that for a reasonably heavy Euro, and I know that with practice, with the rules, and with maybe a little bit more confidence with the software from certain people, you could get a free player game of this done in about 90 minutes, and you could play a four player game of this in about two hours. I do believe it's actually possible. In terms of ease of play, the rulebook is fairly easy to follow, but there's a fair amount of rules that you do need to absorb in order to play the game. I found it a lot easier to learn this with a rules video, and I highly suggest you do this as well. For the most part, the actions aren't that complicated, but the action wheel sometimes gets a little fiddly when you've got to remember how certain things react when you spin the wheel. Say, if a tile gets all the way round, what's the deal with the five victory point marker? Where does it go when you finish your turn? There's a few little odds and ends that sometimes it's easy to forget, and if you happen to miss one of these during the game, then it can cause some problems in terms of actually ending the game at the right time. 
There is also a smorgasbord of iconography in this game, but for the most part, once you're comfortable with the rules, you should be able to figure out what's going on. Unfortunately, the reference sheets don't do the best job of explaining it because they're written in iconography as well. Really, the reference sheets should have had some text on them so that you can refer to them and go, oh, that action means this. But I have to admit, when I was playing this game for the first time, I actually didn't use the reference sheet because it seemed easier to try and remember what, what was being explained in the video than it was trying to even read the reference sheet. In terms of tactics and strategy, this is for the most part a strategic game. You only get about 16 actions in this game to actually do everything you want to do, and there is no way in Hell Steve that you are going to be able to do everything in this game. It's just not possible. You need to find a path from the beginning and kind of stick with it. You will potentially fill up everything there is to do about a specific victory path, and then maybe migrate onto other things as you go along, but don't think that you're going to be able to do every single thing in this game, at least not to an extent where it's actually worth doing. There Therefore, the game becomes a massive efficiency engine. You are taking these action tiles at as best a time as possible, utilizing the bonuses that are around the wheel but also taking into account how expensive the action is to take. And it's no surprise to anyone that the action wheel in this game is the best element of the game. I like how this thing spins around and constantly shifts the costs and benefits of taking certain tiles. You might really want to do an action, but it's going to cost you two gold. Can you afford to use the two gold? You're hoping for an action to appear with a specific bonus because that bonus might allow you to do something more powerful with the action. And of course, as they spin around further around the wheel, not only do they become free to take, but they may also gain you additional victory points for taking them. So you may be tempted to take an action that you weren't desperate to do just yet, mainly because it will get you some extra points, which is probably more efficient than the points you were going to get from taking the action you wanted in the first place. So no, I've gone cross-eyed. The rest of the actions in this game are unfortunately your run-of-the-mill Euro gameness. Basically, each one is a dry point salad affair. Building walls, you put a tile around your player board, rotate it to get certain link bonuses, and that's about it. This cityscape, pretty much the same deal. You put a city tile on the board, you surround other plazas to get bonuses by majority. And then there's two tracks, which are probably some of the most overproduced tracks I've seen in a board game to date with these 3D constructions to represent different levels that you can move your cubes up. Granted, it looks cool when it's on the board, but for a track, it just seems a little bit much. Even moving along the street towards the bridge so you can build on it is essentially another track. Get to the bridge, spend some resources, put a bonus tile out, and then put an endgame scoring tile out. Nothing particularly fancy here. The reward you do get from this game, however, is how you use the tile actions themselves. You only have 16 of them, so when you do take a tile and chain together a sequence of events, usually by either additional actions or just by where you put a specific tile that results in getting you some pretty decent bonuses or a lot of points, then it can feel very good to do so. Of course, there is the flip side of that where you sometimes might just take a tile, gain maybe a couple of points, and then that's about it. Usually I find this with the production actions. It's more fun to sort of go, ooh, I'll build a building here which completes this plaza, and because I have two cubes around it, I get the bonus at the top, and because that included the window, I can do an additional action which then allows me to do this, and it's like, that's a lot more exciting than the alternative type of action you could do, which is I choose to produce gold, which gets me free gold and I get an extra one on my production wheel. Yeah, whoopee. You have to manage gold and stone not only in terms of how much you own but also in what you can produce each time you take the action. You can also upgrade your actions to be slightly better versions than themselves. Unfortunately, this isn't the most exciting route to take. Not only is doing this not the most lucrative in terms of points I seem to find, but it's also not the best, or shall we say, most exciting way of changing your actions. You might go, well, normally I build a wall. Now if I build a wall, I get a point. Whoopee, you know, I was kind of hoping that maybe these upgraded actions would just be a little bit more interesting. The same goes for the technologies. If you level up another track, yeah, you're trying to get the theme here, when you level up another track with textbooks, you get to take technologies at different levels. These technologies are great in the sense that taking them certainly does get you some cool bonuses, particularly in the level 3 and 4 versions, but they're pretty basic technologies. I mean, they don't even have names, I don't think. You essentially just get a tiny little bit extra when you do something. Like, if you take gold as a production action, you get another gold. If you decide that every time you get an egg, you get another point or something. And it's just, I would have liked the technologies to just be a little bit more interesting, like some really cool abilities. But essentially, it's just a case of do something, get a nice little bonus for doing it. I kind of wanted a little bit more out of them. But they're certainly useful and definitely worth going after. 
There's not what I would call a great deal of player interaction in the game either, aside from usurping people's buildings. You do what you like on your player board, your opponent can't influence that. Taking an action tile when somebody else wants it will happen fairly frequently given there's only 6 action tiles to take, but that's no different from a typical worker placement game. You can't kick people off the cube tracks with the cathedral or the uh, the wall or whatever it was called. You know, you kind of just basically do your own thing. The only time when you're that concerned about what the other players are doing is when it comes to building the city tiles. You've got plazas that you can surround in order to gain majority bonuses if you build certain buildings around them. So there is a little bit of push and pull in that if you see somebody surrounding a plaza, you might use the opportunity to put one of your buildings down there so that you can either nab the bonus or share it or get in the way. But again, that only goes so far and that depends how often you are doing the building because as I said, you can't do everything in this game. So it may sound like I'm going down a negative path here, and certainly I wish it was a little bit more exciting at times, it's still a decent set of mechanisms that flow well together. The action wheel kind of carries the game though. The action wheel is done so well that it definitely makes up for some of the shortfalls in the fact that the actions themselves aren't that interesting. There is certainly room to have a plan B in your head, because with only 6 action tiles it's very tense as to whether your tile is going to get taken. Opponents will constantly be deciding, ooh, that tile looks pretty good and it's the one you're staring at and they nab it before you. It certainly does result in some raised voices every now and again. In terms of aesthetics, there are some overproduced elements that look cool on the table but aren't that necessarily needed. I mean, the 3D construction for those point tracks is definitely over the top, but then I would have hate to have seen it if it was just a flat track on the board. The action wheel looks pretty cool and is clear to see, and I like the idea that the little cube in the little cubby hole kind of monitors when you're supposed to deal with swapping tiles out for Era 2, for example. I was a little disappointed with the player boards though. Sure, they look cool, it's nice to have this little spinny wheel that you spin, but all it does is tracks how much gold and stone you have. That's it. There's no purpose for it to be this embellished wheel. When I first heard about this game and they talked about an action crane, I thought this was going to be used for something a lot more intricately than just simply, I have X amount of gold and X amount of stone. They could literally have just made this another separate track, but for some reason they overproduced this element but still have the production tracks as essentially tracks. And as you can see from the player board, there's a lot of tracks on there to begin with. It's a very colourful board as well with some half decent artwork to be seen, but it does work against the game to an extent. The top half of the board is pretty easy to make out what's what, but then when you get into the city area, it becomes a bit more tricky, almost a bit like a Where's Waldo painting. You're looking at a quite a lot of intricate detail that doesn't need to be there, and you're trying to make out where you're supposed to be on the central street getting towards the bridge, but you're also trying to make out where the hexes for the city spaces are, because they're not highlighted in a particularly good way. There's just little tiny little dashes to highlight boundaries on them and it does mean that sometimes you look at the board and don't quite gauge where something's meant to go or how many tiles you can put in various areas. Now this isn't the worst that I've ever seen but certainly it's a little bit cluttered at times. In terms of the immersion, whatever, it doesn't matter with this. You can already tell that this is a pretty dry Euro game. I mean, you're putting tiles around your player board and rotating them to make links to get bonuses. Why? You just do. Literally, the only reason that this has any theme whatsoever is that the historical element is there. The rule book mentions a few little Easter eggs, no pun intended, where it does talk about some factual historical elements of Prague. I was somewhat confused when I was explained that you had eggs in this game to deal with, but then when they explain how eggs featured in the building materials to build the bridge, it's like, okay, fine, you at least did your research. Not that you really feel like you're collecting eggs when you play this game, it's just another, like, a luxury resource that you can use, much like the windows. Why just taking two windows of gold colour allow you to do additional actions? Whatever, they just do. But I guess that's something featured heavily in Prague. So, when you're playing this game, don't expect a thematic experience. It's much like Vladimir Succi's previous work. It's a dry Euro point salad, but that's not necessarily a bad thing considering I do have a very positive history with his two most recent games. In terms of longevity, the replay value is pretty good. You've got B size for the action tiles, you've got a fair amount of era 1 and era 2 tiles that you won't necessarily see every game. Same goes for the technologies, you've got different layouts for the cathedral and the wall 3D construction towers, which I was very surprised about actually. So there's a lot of ways to tweak the game, although you're not 
really going to notice that as you play each game. It's still going to play out pretty much the same way, regardless of whether the cathedral just happens to have a bonus here as opposed to a bonus over there. It's not like it completely fundamentally changes the, the, the play of the game. It's just, oh well, it looks a little bit different than it did before. The solo mode I was also a little bit disappointed with. If you play the solo mode in the base set, I'm not convinced it's even possible to win. It wants you to get 140 points. It is your everyday run of the mill, beat your own score type solo mode. But in the base set, you basically just play by yourself, try to get 140 points, which I'm not even convinced is physically possible to do because you don't get the interaction with the buildings. So what Delicious Games did is that they put out these cards that you could use, which was essentially a very small deck to represent an automna. Although all this really does is that you put cubes on various tiles and that in order to simulate what tile they would build if they take a specific action. You flip the card, you resolve the action at the top, it will have some slightly different rules for solo mode, but effectively it's just simulating the fact that it might take a tile you want to build or an action tile that you want. The only thing is, you know it's going to take an action tile from the last three on the wheel because that's how the cards work. You also know sort of what tile it's going to take in terms of the walls and the buildings and the upgrades because there's a cube on there to tell you what they do. There's no sense of tension as to, oh, you know, maybe it will take the tile that I don't want it to take. Well, you know if it's going to or not because it's there. The timing of when the action will happen, of course, has a little bit of tension, but I would have probably liked it more if the cubes weren't there and it was a case that when it did the action you found some randomizer in order to say what tile it took. To have the ability to kind of plan ahead for what choice an opponent is going to make is not something I was particularly keen on. When my friends taught me this, they said that they were thinking I was going to go down two ways with my first impressions. I was either going to fall in love with this game or I was going to bounce off it pretty hard. Well, shows them, I actually ended up more somewhere in the middle, just more towards the good side. The game, I think, is good, just not great. Most of it feels like any other Euro game I've played. Here's some ways that get points, here's a bunch of tracks, and in here there's a ton of tracks. You know, whoopee, I'm choosing the cathedral or I'm choosing the wall. What's the difference? One is red, one is blue. That's pretty much it. So it's not like the game itself is putting me in any sense of immersion excitement or anything. So it's got to come down to the mechanisms. Now the action wheel is really cool and it's definitely my favorite element. And I do like the fact that there's certainly plenty to think about in terms of having multiple plans. I just wish that the actions themselves were a bit more exciting to do. Yay, I move up this wall track here. I move up this production track here. I move across the street track. It's not exactly like brimming with turns where you can go, yeah, that was amazing. It's like, nah, it's just kind of, oh, that was pretty rewarding. Next. So would this have made my top 10 of 2020 had I played it earlier? Maybe. It could have possibly squeaked onto my list at number 9 or 10, but there's no guarantee of that. Again, I still think the game is good, it's just not one that I want to play that often. Uh, when I finished it, I wasn't desperate to then play it again, at least certainly not for a few days. I was kind of good with it. And then a few days later, I'm like, okay, I'll play another game of it. And then a few days later, I thought, well, let's try out the solo mode now. I wasn't exactly desperate to get back to it. So we'll see how this one fares for me in the future. For now, I would give it a 7 out of 10 based entirely on first impressions. Good. I'd give it a seal of endorsement. I recommend Eurogamers play it. I reckon you'll have some people who will play and love this to death. But in terms of what was the best out of 2020, this is a solid title, just not going to make it anywhere near the top of the list. So that's all for me on this video. I'd be interested to hear your comments as to whether this format works for you. Just seeing a playthrough of the game and me as a voiceover talking about my first impressions when I can't do a full review. Is it something you want to watch more of? Is it something that you weren't as big a fan of? Let me know. I'd be keen to find out more and do my research. If you like what you're seeing, I've earned your subscription. Please consider doing so. Don't forget to check out my Patreon page if you want to support the channel. Please like and share the video as much as you can on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever your platform you want to use. And of course, don't forget to check out the description where you can find my code for 5% discount at zatu.co.uk, where you, if there's a gap in your gaming shelf, now's the time to fill it up. Until next time though, take care and remember, it's only a game. Bye for now.